We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance. Father, we're so thankful um, for the word. We're thankful that we are the sons of God. Um, and um, uh, the, the proof of sonship is the fact that we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we look to you this morning. Um, uh, we know that the words of a man cannot change our lives. Only the breath of God can. So we humble ourselves under your mighty hand this morning, Holy Spirit. We ask you to help us. Uh, Lord, I pray for me. I pray for that you help me this morning. Um, uh, you are the one that makes preaching easy and hearing the word of sweet delight. So I just rely on the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, for a few weeks now, we've been talking about kingdom culture. Kingdom culture. And you know, when we talk about culture... Culture speaks about the ideas, the customs, the social behavior of a particular people. The way a particular people behave. Okay? And the way they behave is, uh, is the result of their values. What they consider priority. And these values are so ingrained in them that when you interact with them... Um, you, you always get that coming through. Amen. Uh, you know, when you go to different nations, you are able to pick up the culture of the nation. You know, for instance, the United States, it's a very can-do culture. Okay? Can-do culture. You know, it's, it's, it's known for entrepreneurialism. Um, you know, it's a can-do culture. And people that come from the States tend to have this attitude about themselves that, you know what, you know, um, my government will never let me down. You know, there's just that thing of no American left behind kind of thing. Okay? And it's just the culture. And everyone exudes that. Um, and, and in different nations, you, you see culture coming through. And it's an expression of ingrained values. Everyone say ingrained values. Now, now in high life, um, we, we want to articulate what our culture is. Uh, we, you know, uh, uh, the way I see high life, it's like the nation of Israel had different tribes, okay? And um, uh, there were 12 tribes in Israel. You can say uh, the priesthood was the 13th tribe, but the 12 tribes in Israel. And every, it was still one nation, but, but every tribe had its culture. Things that they were known for within the culture of Israel. Okay, so the sons of Issachar or the tribe of Issachar, they, they were you know, not a very large tribe, but they were known for their wisdom and their strategic thinking. Um, uh, the tribe of Judah was a tribe of praise. Yeah? And as, uh, as high life, we believe that there is a certain emphasis within the kingdom of God that God has given us. So if God is leading you here um, to be partners with us, it is important that you understand the culture of the house. And this culture comes from the kingdom, but it is also based on the emphasis that God has given us. Hallelujah. So we've been talking about this for a few weeks, and I've covered two areas, and I'm going to be looking at the third this morning. But if you've missed our previous sessions, um, I would advise you to go online uh, to our website because you can download them for free. The first one we looked at is the understanding that we are not from here. We are not from here. And as a, com as a kingdom community, as we understand these values, and all these values really come from the word, as we understand these values, it will help you understand how we function as a church. Because these values color everything we do and, and um, how we, what we consider important. Now, the first value is that we're not from here. And we've spent time on this. We've explained the fact that you and I were created from the highest heavens. We were created from a place where there were different races of angels 
and four-faced creatures and created from there in the image and in the likeness of Almighty God, of an eternal God. And it is from that place that we have been sent to the earth to represent God and the culture of heaven. Hallelujah. So in our operation, we recognize that we are not from here. We have access to a higher realm. We have come from a higher realm. We are spiritual beings that have been sent to function in the realm of time for a period to fulfill the will of the Father. And after we have served in the realm of time and we have fulfilled our destiny, we are going to go back home. Hallelujah. And therefore, as a kingdom person that is operating from a kingdom mentality, you should be involved in activities that are not just earthly. Does that make sense? As a kingdom person, you should be involved in activities that are not just earthly. Because why? Because you're not from here. It means... That you should be experiencing things that are not just earthly because what? You are not from here. So if all I'm doing, if the range of my activities are earthly, if my scope of operation is merely earthly, then I'm not functioning from this value that I'm not from here. Does that make sense? Uh Uh-huh. So it means... That we should not feel weird about spiritual things. Hallelujah. When my spirit gives expression in the physical realm, it shouldn't freak you out. Why? Because I am what? If someone walks around you and they are speaking their foreign language because they were born in Moscow, will you be freaked out? You just say, ah, they are not from here. Uh Uh-huh. We're not from here. We're not from here. It needs to be an ingrained value and you need to push it. Hallelujah. You, you need to push it. You need, if the way they, they vie for contracts is using earthly methods, you need to push that thing and enter into the realm of God and use spiritual things to dominate your contract application. Why? Because what? You are not from here. If there is a king that has a problem and they don't know the solution and he has brought all the wise men around and they can't find the answer, you need to go into the secret place, go into prayer and fasting and push that thing and access a wisdom that is not from here and bring the solution to that problem. Why? Because you are not from here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. That's value one. We're not from here. So we don't back up. We don't draw back because the doctor has given us a sentence. We don't draw back because the economy is speaking to us. When they speak to us, we speak back using access that is not from here. We are not from here. We do not run at the threats. Of one. Because those that are with us are greater than those that are against us. We're not from here. Number two, without his presence, we are nothing. Without his presence, we are nothing. We are a people of his manifested presence. We were made to walk with him and we are not satisfied with anything less. Hallelujah. We're a people of his manifested presence. We were made to walk with God. In the garden, the Bible says God came to fellowship with them in the cool of the day. Hallelujah. Thank God for what Jesus did. He has restored that level of fellowship. (laughs) Hallelujah. We're a people of his manifested presence. We haven't been this way before, therefore, it is only through his active manifestation in our lives 
that we will arrive at our destination. Hallelujah. And we've spent time looking at that. It's only through his active manifestation. So we must have his active manifestation. If we're going to get to the place that he has destined for us. We can't get there without him. Hallelujah. And not, we can't get there without him in heaven. We can't get there without him actively manifested in our lives. And we spend time looking at the way he led Israel. Through the wilderness. That's the way he's going to lead us. Because he desires to lead us through a path of wonder. When people, why people, a path that will cause people to wonder about you. We sing God of wonders. But people are meant to wonder about us. They wondered about Israel all the time. How is this possible? Because they followed his manifest presence. Because that presence will lead you sometimes through a time of difficulty to teach us to depend on him and to break the power of this world from our lives. Then when we have learned to quiet our souls in loving trust, then he will show us how to walk through dry ground in the Jordan. He will lead us into times of personal encounter with him where our identity is not based on things around us, but is based on covenant. Then he will transition us from a wilderness culture to be stewards of his inheritance in the promised land where we'll take our seat as his government in the earth. We will begin to receive divine strategies to bring solutions to temporal problems. We will begin to command armies of heaven as we advance the kingdom of God in the earth. We see all of this between Joshua 3 and Joshua 5. Hallelujah. It was not a surprise that the, um, that the captain of the host of heaven came to Joshua. Because they had gone through a process. Say to a neighbor, your neighbor, they had gone through a process. They had gone through a process of learning. They had gone through the Jordan. They had gone through a process of learning to trust God in the midst of nothing. They had entered a place of humility and covenant with Almighty God. He had begun to induct them into the culture of the kingdom. And now it was time for the kingdom of God to advance through them. And they began to do things that caused the army of heaven to respond to them in the earth. There are spiritual armies that will respond to you. Hallelujah. Look at the victory over Jericho. It was not the might of man that caused the victory over Jericho. It was the spiritual army. Hallelujah. This kingdom is going to be advanced through you, through the operation of a spiritual army, but that will only happen for people that have submitted to the process of God. That's why number two is without his presence, we are nothing. We are not going anywhere. We will just keep running around the mountain over and over again, exchanging scriptures and not actually moving forward in God's plan for our lives. Amen. So number three, I'll just go to three to seven and we'll focus on three. By the way, since I was doing a recap, I'm just starting technically. So number three is meditation is the key to transformation into his image in every aspect of life. That's what I'm going to focus on this morning. Number four, we are here to shift culture, not produce good events and experiences. You know, sometimes we Christians are known for good events. How was church today? Man, the worship was otherworldly. We go from concert to concert, conference to conference, we are known for good events and experiences. The value of this house is that these good events had better result in the shift of culture through your life and my life. We're not here to have good events. We're here to shift culture. Number five, we get to bear fruit forever. We, be, we get to bear fruit forever, so we plant the seed of God. 
Number six, we are building a culture of family. A culture of family. Hallelujah. You know, in family, we don't disown one another. If we have a culture of family, we can fight, but we're not going anywhere. We've got to sort our problems out. Uh-huh. Culture of family is like, well, I didn't like how they preached to me last week, so I'm going to find another church. That's not family. Hallelujah. We're building a culture of family. God is building family in the earth. That's why when you and I were born again, he baptized us into his body. And all we are is a body part. I have no identity outside of my function within the context of a body. I don't get to choose where I go and what I do. Because I'm a body part. If, you're, if your hand wants independence, guess what happens to it? It dies. So Christians are shivering, shriveling up and dying and wondering why God is not uh, helping them. Well, they have left the place of their sustenance and the place that God has sent them to. Because it is in the house of God that you flourish. Jandai. If I do not honor my father and mother, guess what will happen to me? It will not be well with me. I will not live long on the earth. doesn't matter how many confessions uh, you make. Are you with me? Because you need to align with what God is doing. He's connecting us to family. That's a value of the kingdom. Number seven. We achieve transformational revival through seven things. Worship, intercession, fasting, watching, meditation, holiness, and oneness. Now that is a recap. So today, I'm going to be focusing on number three. On number three. Meditation is the key to transformation into his image in every aspect of our lives. Every aspect. Everyone say every aspect. Or say it again. Every aspect of our lives. You know, this series will take us, if we are listening, into new practices and new habits. Hallelujah. It will lead us into new practices and new habits. You know, it is consistency that brings clarity. Yeah, it is consistency that big brings clarity. Okay, so if we are if we embrace these values at a heart level, it will lead us into new practices and new habits. So, for instance, we learned last week that in seeking God's presence, if you are not waiting on the Lord, then you are not. Praying effectively. We learned that last week about seeking the presence of God. We said, if you are not waiting on the Lord, you are not praying effectively. In other words, if your prayer time, you know, we say we are seeking God's presence, we've prayed about it. If your prayer time does not include a time when you watch to see what he will say to you, as Habakkuk taught us, then you will never, everyone say never, you will never receive the full benefit of prayer. Some of you missed this, so I'm going to say it again. If your time of prayer, how many of us have prayed this morning? Uh huh. You know you're in the presence of God, don't be lying to Jesus. If your time of prayer does not include a time where you watch to see what he will say to you, then you will never receive the full benefit of prayer. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, that call upon me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. The New Living Translation says, ask of me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you did not know about things to come. So a time of prayer is meant to include a time when the Lord begins to reveal something to you. Hallelujah. And Habakkuk taught us and said, you know what? I will stand on, the, on my watchtower and I will stay at my guard post and I will watch to see what he will say. So after, 
how, how, how he will answer my request or my complaint. So Habakkuk asked the Lord something. And then after asking the Lord, he waited. Everyone say what? He waited to see. He was expecting to do what? To see. He was expecting information. So if all I do when I pray is I tell the Lord some stuff, I get up and I walk away, then I will never receive the full benefit of that prayer because when he stands to tell me and to show me, I have left. To catch the Akada, to catch the Marawa, to catch the boss, to be busy doing nothing. Because really, a moment in the presence of God when he, where he gives you revelation is much more and much more profitable than 20 years uh, trying to do things yourself. So this series will open the door to new practices. And when you start practicing these things consistently, you will have new habits that will open up the door to new experiences for you. Amen. So meditation is the key to transformation into his image in every aspect of life. Every aspect of life. Notice it doesn't say it is a key. It is what? The key. And it didn't say into some aspects. The key. You want to be transformed into his image. In any aspect of your life, you need one key. It is called the key of what? The key of meditation. So that means that if you are not using this key, you are not being transformed. That is our understanding. Are you with me? Now, you know, in Jeremiah chapter 1, or sorry, Psalms 1, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not after the counsel or in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he what? Meditate day and night. He shall be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, what, what will prosper? What will prosper? Whatever he does will prosper. Now, notice, he didn't say that the righteous person will prosper in everything he does. He says this person doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. So he's a righteous person. He does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not sit in the seat of the scornful. So he's doing the right thing. Are you with me? And then he now jumps to he shall be. Like the what? River of water. Is that what he did? No. You've jumped. You see, don't just follow them because they are telling you this is the way. Yeah. He didn't say that, okay, because he did not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Therefore, he shall be like a tree planted by a Is that what he says? No. He said he didn't do these things, but he did something. He meditated. Very specific. He meditated in the word day and night. And as a result of his meditation in the word day and night, then he became like the tree. The tree just didn't appear by the river of water. He located himself in a place of unending nourishment through his practice of meditation. Through his practice of meditation. You see, reading the Bible without meditation is like being served a hot plate of delicious food while you are hungry and never eating the food. Can you imagine you are very hungry? I'm not eating all day. And then, you know, someone invites you to their house and they make the best meal you have ever, I mean, your favorite meal. 
and you can see it, it looks like your favorite meal. You can smell it. It smells like your favorite meal. And you are hungry, you sit down in front of it and you just look at it. Reading the Bible without meditating on the word is exactly like that. You know, studying the Bible without meditating on it is like they serve you the meal and then you begin to eat it. Yeah? How many of you that that's a good idea? You begin to eat the food, you chew it and then you spit it out. You take another muscle, you chew it and you... studying the Bible without meditating on it is exactly like that. It will not just, it will not just um, give you any value. In fact, it's not like you will get some benefit. You will get none. Because you know what? If you chew and you spit and you chew and you spit and you chew and you spit, you know, you will have this sensation of eating, right? But you know, it's not what you eat that benefits your body and gives you energy. It is what you swallow and is assimilated into your system. Are you with me? Reading the Bible without meditation... Studying the Bible without meditation is exactly like that. Because reading is to give you um, familiarity. It's to give you information. Study will give you understanding. But if you want transformation, you've got to meditate on it. Are you with me? Reading will give you information. You'll be able to tell me, ah, the Bible says it. Studying will actually give you understanding, but meditation is required for transformation. Remember, Jesus said something in Matthew 7. He said, the person that hears my word and does not do it, in Matthew 7, 24, he said, is like the man who builds his house on what? On sand. The rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and hit the house, and great was what? The destruction of that house. All right? The person who hears his word and doesn't do it, right, is like the person who builds something. Now, notice this man actually built the house, right? It's not like he didn't build a house. He actually did some stuff, all right? He built the house, but he heard and didn't do. He did what? And didn't do. But you know that doing the word, to do the word, it takes more than hearing. In order to do the word, it takes more than hearing. In fact, it actually takes more than a good intention. And we all know that anyone that has ever... Um, had a New Year's resolution understands that it takes more than good intentions to do what you know you should do. Do you know that? You know, we don't talk about New Year's resolutions anymore. Do you know why? Because we have all realized that it doesn't work. Because in order to do something, it takes more than a good intention. Are you with me? So Jesus said, if all you have is you are hearing the word, and you have a good intention, you will never actually do the word because it takes more than willpower to do the word of God. Amen. It takes more than what? Willpower to do. You know, when God was speaking to Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. And then he said, you know, you are going to lead these people. Now, can you imagine being a leader following Moses? Moses was one of the greatest leaders they had ever had. Yeah? He had done all these miracles. Must have been quite intimidating for Joshua. And then this great leader didn't actually get them to the promised land. His mentor failed in fulfilling God's full heart for him. So imagine following that kind of guy, your hero. Who faltered at, you know, the final stage. And God said, don't be afraid. Now, why do you think the Lord would tell him not to be afraid? Because he was afraid. I mean, why do you think that Jesus always says, 
Fear not when he manifests. Because the first thing that people feel is fear. He says, don't be afraid and be very what? Courageous. God was encouraging him. Don't be afraid, be very courageous. Don't be afraid. In that passage, in that Joshua 1, you see, don't be afraid many times. But in the middle of the don't be afraid, you know, like don't be afraid, don't be afraid. In the middle of all of that, God gives him the secret. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, he says, But this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate there in day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Hallelujah. Now notice, God could have said, you know what, don't be afraid, I'll I'll make you successful. Isn't that what we think? That's not what he said in in, in Psalm 1. In fact, in Psalm 1, he was not involved in the process. You didn't see God's name mentioned. As in the, his name is only mentioned at the end of Psalm 1 when he says that he observes the way of the righteous. But he said to the righteous person, um, walk in my way and meditate in the word day and night and then you will have good success. He said to Joshua, don't be afraid. I know you are scared. I know it looks like insurmountable. I know there are too many people and they're always complaining. I know they are a stiff-necked people. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay, let me show you what will give you strength in the midst of this. Every day, meditate in my word. Because when you meditate in my word, then you'll be able to do my word. Joshua knew the word. But it takes much more than willpower to do the word of God. Hallelujah. He says meditate in it. He didn't say read it. He said meditate. He didn't say study. He said meditate. After you have read, after you have studied, you need to meditate. Because it is meditation that is the key to doing the word. And it is when you do the word that you will make your way. You will make your way. You will make your way. You will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Meditation. Meditation is the key to transformation in every aspect of your life into his image. You know in Psalm 119 verse 11 he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that am I not sin against you. So in order not to sin against him, I have to hide my word. I have to hide his word in my heart. Hallelujah. Meditation is the process to hiding the word of God in your heart. In Proverbs 4.20, uh, Solomon by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit said, My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them, keep them, keep them, keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. It is only through meditation that this word will become one in my heart. And it is only then that the life of the word will strengthen me to do what the word says. It is only with meditation that you'll be strong, courageous, obey the word. And make your way prosperous and have good success. Now let's unpack this a little bit. You know, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak to you, this is John 6, 63, they are spirit and they are life. He says it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits what? Nothing. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And then he was speaking to the Jews one time. In John 5, 39, he said, you are searching the scriptures. He says, for you think that in them you have eternal life. But the scriptures are actually talking about me. You search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures are actually talking about about me. In other words, 
When Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and are life, what that means is that you don't get spirit and life just because you have a scripture. Do you understand what I mean by that? Because these Pharisees had the scriptures and they could quote the scriptures from, you know, Genesis, um, you know, to Joshua and, you know, to other the, the books of Psalms and the prophets. But when Jesus came, the scriptures were actually talking about Jesus, but they didn't see it. So you can have the scriptures and not have life. Are you with me? In other words, you can have a PhD in Bible and still go to hell. Is what I'm saying. Okay? The scriptures, the holy scriptures, are a physical documentation of a spiritual substance. Hallelujah. You know, if I show you a picture of an apple, you are not going to get full. Does that make sense? Because a picture is a is a uh, is length by breadth, I mean, two plane, but an apple is three plane. Are you with me? Now the scriptures, the holy scriptures given by the inspiration of the Lord, a scripture is a documentation. All right? And it's meant to lead you. It's meant to lead you to a living substance who is Christ. Are you with me? So you have not received the power of a scripture until it leads you to the substance of the scripture, which is Christ. Just because you have a scripture does not mean you have life. Uh huh. But that scripture can lead you somewhere. It is a graphic, it is a document. But it's meant to lead you to a living substance because God is documenting or has documented in scripture. Um, a, a, it's, like a doc, it's like a doorway into substance. And there is a process through which you go through that doorway to interact with the substance behind the door. And that process... Is the process of meditation. Is the process of meditation. It is the process that takes you through the door. And you now begin to interact with the life behind the door. Who is a person. Jesus Christ himself. So he was saying to the Pharisees. You've been interacting with the scriptures. But you haven't been interacting with me. The scriptures are an invitation to interact with me. Hallelujah. You know, Christian mystics used to say this thing. Now, when I use the word mystic, I am not being a new ager. All right? Anything that the devil does is, um, uh, is like a counterfeit of the real thing. Yeah? The word mystic, when you look at the word mystic... In fact, that word came from the church. And that word mystic literally means people who believe that they can know God by experience. Are you with me? People who believe that in this life, while they are walking on planet earth, they can have a real experiential uh, interaction with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were called mystics. Now, how many of you believe that you can have a real interaction, a substantive interaction with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit while you are still on planet Earth? Guess how many mystics we have in the house? Now, you see, Christian mystics used to say this thing. They used to say that there are four dimensions. Four, everyone say four dimensions. Or say it again, four dimensions. Now we all interact with three of these four dimensions, um, you know, frequently. But without knowing it. But there are four dimensions. They said there's the dimension of manifestation. Everyone say the dimension of what? 
the dimension of manifestation, the dimension of formation, the dimension of creation, and the dimension of emanation, which is the dimension of God. The dimension of manifestation is the physical dimension. Yeah? Everything you can touch, taste, feel, and hear is in one dimension, isn't it? The dimension of what? Manifestation. But they said there's another dimension called the dimension of formation, which is like the dimension of thought. Thought. Now, have you noticed that thought is not physical? Yeah? Now, now we, we, we somehow associate it with physical things because we are so used to thinking. But can you touch a thought? You can't. Can you taste a thought? You can't. Can you see a thought? Can you feel a thought? So a thought is in a dimension that is not physical. And you and I are interacting with that dimension all the time. So, so how many of you believe that you interact with at least two dimensions a dimension is just a plane of existence yeah if you put a thought behind beside a microphone then two dimensions are they not now the third dimension is the dimension of creation now do you know that in order for anything to be manifested you've got to think about it first so in order for this lectern to be here, somebody had to think. They had to interact with a dimension. And then based on that thought, they moved this lectern here. And hopefully they dusted it before they left it here. Now that is the dimension of thought. Now they said there is actually a dimension that is higher than thought. It is the dimension of what? Creation. Now that dimension of creation is the dimension of imagination. 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 Now, imagination is a higher dimension than thought. Why? Because thoughts are based on what you know. Imagination moves into the realm of the unknown. When you start imagining... You are beginning to enter into a realm that you are not familiar with. Is that not true? Okay. Now, in order for something to be created, you can't just think about it. You need to imagine. Because thoughts are based on what you know. Imagination is actually based on what you don't know. Yeah? To bring something new, a new product, a new solution, you can't just think, you must imagine. You must imagine. So imagination is a different realm. It is a realm of creation. So they said that in order for something new to come into the earth, for it to be manifested, you can't just think. You need to start what? Imagining. 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 And that is why the creators are great. What's the word? They are great imaginators, are they not? I mean, you are doing, and they're just sitting down. What are you doing? I'm imagining. The person that he imagines has the opportunity to create that which the person that is just thinking is spending all his time just manifesting what is known. And that is why in Genesis eleven six, when they decided to build this tower, God said that nothing that they have imagined will be, will be withheld from them because they have learned to key into the third dimension, which is the dimension of imagination. And the person that operates from that dimension dominates thought and dominates the manifested realm. Are we going to deep this morning? We're not, are we? Good. But then there's a fourth realm, which is the realm of God himself. So it's like a ladder. That is the realm that God operates from. 
You know, there are people who are great creators who don't have an ounce of God in them. That's what happened in Babel. And God confused. You know, God had to confuse their language. He had to confuse their ability to interact powerfully between that realm of imagination and the realm of thought. Their communication between realms and communication with one another was disrupted. Are you with me? Because humanity has the ability to operate in all four dimensions because we are created in the image and likeness of God. So there is a higher realm, which is the realm of God himself. So it's like a ladder that goes from where to where. Goes from manifestation to thought to imagination to the realm of God. I'm going somewhere with this. Now, whenever I think about a ladder... Guess what I think about? Jacob. Remember when Jacob was... Um, when Jacob was escaping his father and he had this experience that he said was the house of God. Bethel. And in Bethel, he saw a ladder and angels ascending and descending and God was at the top of the ladder. Are you with me? And angels went up the ladder and came down the ladder. And went up the ladder and came down the ladder. Yeah? They went, they interacted with God, and they came down to the earth. Yeah? And then Jesus in the New Testament said, I am that ladder. So if you climb me, you will go up into the realm of emanation and come down to the realm of manifestation. So a child of God is meant to go up the ladder and come down the ladder. That's how we function. Up the ladder and down the ladder. Up the ladder and down the ladder. The four realms or four dimensions of life are dominating everything we do. Now, what does this have to do with meditation? Say to your neighbor, if you want to experience transformation, you have to climb the ladder. Say to the other neighbor, if you want to experience transformation, you have to climb the ladder. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to climb the ladder. Because Jesus said the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. When you interact with the word, you will interact with the realm of God. Are you with me? You will climb the ladder. The process of meditation must go from here through thought and imagination into the realm of God. Are you with me? Remember what Paul said about the way that enemy works. You see, this is already working in our lives. He said that even though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, there is more to you than what you can see and touch. And the things that are coming against you are more than what you can see and touch. Yeah? He said we do not war after the flesh. He said the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, being in a readiness to punish all disobedience when our obedience is complete. So he's saying that you are already engaged in a battle and unfortunately you are losing because you have not learned how to dominate other dimensions. He said there is a dimension of thought and we need to learn how to take those thoughts captive. You know, a lot of us Christians think that it is only what we do that matters. What you do is in what realm? The realm of manifestation. It's like having an assembly line and a car pops out at the end of the assembly line and you destroy that car. You say this is the disguise of the devil. You burn the car. It's an assembly line. Guess what you'll have to do next time? Another car will show up. You destroy that one. The third car shows up. You dis but there's a production system that is producing it. If you don't deal with the production system, you can't change manifestation. The realm of manifestation is the lowest realm. 
And if you are not learning to, if you think, well, this is too deep for me, guess what? Your enemy understands this process and he is using it against you. And he is winning if you have not learned to dominate the process. Because Paul says you have to use your spiritual weapons. Your thoughts are important. Because the enemy is attacking your thoughts and your thoughts are producing your reality. Because the realm of formation is greater than the realm of manifestation. And then he says go higher. There is a realm of imagination. There are strongholds that have established themselves in, your, in this realm of imagination. And those strongholds, you need to destroy them by entering that realm. Because that is the realm that creation comes from. You are already operating in all those realms. And Satan is establishing strongholds in our lives until we go into those realms and through meditation, we, pro- we bring uh, liberty into our lives in those realms. If you are not meditating, you are not touching the realm of thought, you are not touching the realm of creation, which is the realm of imagination. Hallelujah. And you know, when we talk about this ladder, it is not like a ladder going from, from here into the realm of heaven. Because the realm of heaven is within us. Are you with me? The realm of heaven is where? It's within us. Why? Because Jesus is within us. So if we're going to go from the manifestation to emanation, it is in here. It's in the heart. Are you with me? So meditation in two minutes. So meditation hits all those realms. Hallelujah. So it begins with taking a verse of scripture. A verse of scripture and muttering it to yourself. Now that is starting from the realm of what? Manifestation. You are muttering it to yourself. When you meditate, you are muttering it to yourself. And what you are meditating on is who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. Every meditation. Say to anybody, every meditation. Every meditation involves who you are in Christ and who Christ is what? In you. Every meditation has to do with who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. If you are meditating on the glories of heaven and the glories of God, to make it a true meditation, you need to remember that that glory of God is in you. It is not a God that is removed out into the galaxy somewhere. No, because your body is the temple. Of the living God. So any meditation that you are having of God, for it to transform your life, it has to be brought into the context of the fact that that God, Christ in you, is the hope of glory. If you are meditating on the mercy of God, you've got to bring it to the fact that that mercy is renewed over your life day after day. So every meditation is a meditation of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. If it is a meditation that is moved outside the context of your life, it is not going to transform your life. Because it is a God that can do it for somebody else, but I don't know if he will do it for me. So it begins with you muttering what the word says about himself or what the, what the word of God says about who God is in you and who you are in God. Hallelujah. Everyone say muttering. Oh, muttering. Muttering is a physical thing. Muttering is a physical thing because your mouth opens and you are speaking it to yourself. There is a vibration that is going on in your body. You can't see the sound, but every cell of your body, every nerve ending of your body is receiving that sound. Hallelujah. It's receiving that. Every time you speak, there is a vibration that is going through your body. Whenever you speak the word, there is a vibration that is going through your body. Hallelujah. So meditation begins in the realm of manifestation with a a vibration. You are saying something to yourself about who God is in you and who you are in Christ. And then you enter into the realm of thought. Then you begin
begin to think about what it is saying. Hallelujah. Christ in me, the hope of glory. You engage your thought. You now enter the thought realm. Christ, that word Christ is not his surname. Christ is the anointed one and his anointing. Everything in Christ destroys darkness. Everything in Christ breaks the yoke of the enemy. Everything in Christ declares that every knee must bow and every tongue confess. I can't meditate on Colossians 1.27, Christ in me, the hope of glory, and not think about who Christ is. In the realm of thought, you are beginning to think, yes, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Hope speaks about a confident expectation. So with Christ in me, I can have a confident expectation that in my life, the glory of God will be manifested. Irrespective of what my neighbor says. Irrespective of what my parents said. Christ in me, Christ in me is enough. Christ in me is sufficient to manifest the glory of God in my life. The realm of thought, you are thinking about it. And Satan immediately attacks you. Don't you know who you are? And then you attack him back in the realm of thought. Yes, I know who I am. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Christ in me is the expectation of glory. Then he reminds you how much you have in your bank account. And you say, "Uh, yes, I know how much I have in my bank account. But I have hope because my hope is not based on my bank balance. Christ in me is the expectation, the confident expectation that this life will manifest the glory of God. And he will say, look at your family. You are the least in your family. Your name is not known in this nation. And then you will say to him that God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. Yes, I know the people from whom I have come. I know the name that we have called, but I have a different name now. It is Christ in me that is the hope of glory. And then you rise from that realm into the realm of creation. And then you begin to see yourself. The realm of creation is the realm of imagination. Through the portal of the scripture, you begin to see yourself as as being in present possession of that which God says about you. It is no longer something that will happen. It is something that you see yourself as now. Hallelujah. Because the word of God concerning you is always in the present and never in the future. That is why Abraham changed his name to Abraham before he had his first child. Because he entered the realm of imagination and he began to see himself as the father of many nations. God said to him, the father of many nations, I have made you now. Hallelujah. God showed him the realm of the spirit. God showed him the realm of God. God showed him in the word who he had called him to be. And, and, and Abraham took that word and began to build that word into his imagination. The realm of imagination is the realm of creation in your life. What you believe is true in the realm of imagination is what will end up dominating your thoughts and is what will end up dominating your manifestation. What is manifested in your life is what you truly believe concerning yourself. Hallelujah. I'm not impressed with what you say. Because at the end of the day, it's not what you say that's going to come to pass. It's what you believe. That is going to come to pass. Of course, if you believe it, you will say it. And if you say it, it will happen. But the root is not your saying. People say all kinds of stuff. Hallelujah. They get around the pastor. Or they get around somebody they want to impress. And they speak the word of God like never before. But when they get into the secret of their lives. When they get into their secret place. What they are saying in their secret place. Is what they are creating for themselves. Hallelujah. 
They, they say a few scriptures in church and as soon as the enemy comes, you see the enemy is trying to fight you. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus kept saying that the secret of your life is the word of God. But the enemy is going to do everything to fight you planting that word in your heart. He's going to try to steal it before you get it. And then when you get it, he's going to try to cause you to be distracted by everything else so that you do not plant it in your heart through meditation. We don't have time for meditation anymore because we are watching Netflix. We are watching Showmax. We are watching... uh, What's the one on... um, What's the one on... Amazon. Amazon Prime. We are watching DSTV. We've got to talk to that person on Instagram. We've got to talk to that person on Facebook. The devil is doing everything to ensure that you don't meditate on the word. Let's distract them so that that word, they don't plant it in their hearts. And then let's plant other things there. The lust of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, let it choke the word. Because the devil knows that if you spend time with the word and meditate on the word and ascend from the realm of what you can see and dominate the realm of thought and dominate the realm of creation and enter into the realm of God, you are going to bring God into your life. He knows you are going to bring God into your life. Because something happens, as you begin to imagine the word, this is who I am, this is what I have. As you lay back in quietness and you are imagining what the word says, you are entering the realm of creation. You are entering the realm of creation. And something happens in the realm of creation. You see, to enter the realm, you can't just enter into God's realm. The Holy Spirit has to take you in. The Spirit of God has to take you in. But the Spirit of God is waiting for you in the realm of creation. Hallelujah. He's waiting for you. He's saying, come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Because it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's waiting for you in the realm of creation. The Bible says that the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the spirit of of God was there. He was waiting for the word to come forth. Because the spirit will give life to the word. As you enter the realm of imagination. The spirit of God is waiting for you there. And that's why 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. That we all. As we continue to behold. In the word the glory of God. Are transformed into the same image uh, from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God meets you in the realm of creation and He takes you into the realm of God and you begin to see who you truly are. Hallelujah. And the life of that word will come alive in you. And then you are changed. You are changed. You are changed. And you receive the power to do what, you, what, you, what the word says. That's where the power to do comes from. It's not going to come from your willpower. That is energized by the flesh. No. It's the life of God. From the realm of God. Where the Holy Spirit dwells. Hallelujah. While everyone is shouting. You don't need to shout. For power to come from, from your being. Because it's who you are now. When Abraham was just walking around giving glory to God, he was creating, he he, he was releasing power. Hallelujah. You don't need to have a womb to have a child. You don't need to have a high sperm count to have a child. Yeah? Because the word of God is creative. The word of God is creative. The word of God is creative. It has the power within itself to bring itself to pass. But the word of God is beyond the scripture. The scripture is the door to the word. Because the word of God is a person. The word of God is Christ. And when you truly have the word of God, you interact with Christ. Who is life, who is light, who is power, who is love. Hallelujah. Every interaction with the word is an interaction with the life of God. And you have not interacted with the word until you enter the life. Hallelujah. And that life will change you. It will change what you see. It will change what you say. It will change how you act. It will change how you see people. 
One man of God once said that when you see the Lord, you will no longer be impressed with people. The reason why we stand before a president and we shake like a leaf is because we have not seen the Lord. When you see the Lord that you represent, you see the Lord that has crowned you with grace and glory. You see the Lord that dwells on the inside of you. You will never be impressed with people. If you are impressed with people, then you still need to enter the realm of creation and meditate on the Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you are, conf- when you are, when you are confronted with an in- impossible task and your heart shakes, you have not seen the Lord yet. Because when David saw the Lord, he said, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom, I, whom shall I be afraid? He said, When an enemies come against me, my heart will not fail. Let me read one verse of scripture and we'll close. I don't know what's happened to the clock. I can't see it anymore. Look at Psalm 37. We'll read this verse in the Passion Translation. This is the value we have. That meditation is the key to transformation. If I need transformation in my life, I don't need to run helter skelter. I need to find out what God has said about this and I need to enter meditation. Hallelujah. Meditation. Meditation. You know this ladder that goes up also comes down. You know sometimes we enter the ladder from the bottom. But sometimes, stuff comes from above. Are you with me? And that's why God said in Joel chapter 2, I didn't open the verse, so that's not the last verse. Joel chapter 2, he said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see the visions. Prophecy is access into into the mind of God. You're not starting from scripture, are you? You're not starting from scripture. When the prophets of old said, thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, it was not scripture that they climbed on. It came from above, did it not? When, it, when God comes to you and bypasses your mind and bypasses the knowledge of scripture you have and he gives you a dream and you know it's a dream of God. Guess what's happening? Something is coming from above, from the realm of creation itself. Hallelujah. It is a two-way ladder. When that dream comes, when that prophecy comes, you need to start meditating on it as well like you meditate on scripture. Are you listening to me this morning? You need to start meditating on it. You need to use that scripture to attack the devil in your mind. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Whether it's coming from scripture or it's coming from God himself. Hallelujah. You need to start meditating on that, on that word of the Lord. That dream. Meditate on it. Let the spirit of God as- cause you to ascend with that dream. Hallelujah. And show you the how. Psalm 37 verse 4. Oh, I am speaking this word because this is a great day of ascension for the people of God. We have moved from the, from the wilderness. We are entering the promised land. God is about to give his people strategies in this time. Because the kingdom of God is advancing. The kingdom is advancing. And it is superior knowledge and superior wisdom that is going to dominate the earth. In Psalm 37, verse 3. It says, keep trusting in the Lord and do what is right in his eyes. Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will be secure. Feasting on his faithfulness. Feasting. On his faithfulness. David said that when they run helter skelter. I will go and meditate in your word. Go and read Psalm 119. He says when kings and princes are running. I am going to meditate. Doesn't he have work to do? Is he not a king? Is he not a business leader? He knows where the secret of his life is. If God could advise Joshua to do this. You are no bigger than Joshua. David said, this is what I do. I keep trusting the Lord to do what is right in his, and I do what is right. I don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. 
I don't stand in the way of sinners. I don't sit in the seat of the uncomfortable, but that is not enough. Say to the neighbor, that is not enough. Yeah, say it, say it again. It's not enough. He says, I fix. I fix. I fix. I fix. Why is he fixing? Because there are things that are trying to pull him away from it. He said, I fix my heart on the promises of God. What God has said, I fix my heart. Because that is what is going to cause me to ascend into the realm of knowledge. I fix my heart. And then I feast on his faithfulness. Now, when kings are feasting, they, I mean, have you ever been to a feast before? He said, this is what I feast on. What are you feasting on? Jesus said, the good man, out of the good abundance of his heart, brings forth what? Good things. Hallelujah. What, is, what are you feasting on? What represents the abundance of your heart? He says, my heart is fixed. In the New Testament, Philippians 4, 6, he says, be careful for nothing in everything. With prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. And then the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind. If your heart is fluttering, it's because you have not fixed your heart on the promises of God. You are not feasting. You are not feasting. You are not feasting on his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Meditation is the key to transformation. Into his image in every aspect of our lives. Did you get something from the word this morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let's give blessing. <laughs> oh, glory to God. We advance.